Northerners generally turned a blind eye to the southern lifestyle. For since the country began, the South had held the economic power due to agriculture. But by the 1850s, the balance of power was swinging northward with the manufacturing and mechanization boom of the Industrial Revolution. The borders of our country were changing as well through manifest destiny. And each time a fledgling territory requested statehood, the two sections of North and South would clash, particularly over the expansion of slavery. We had no thought of discussing the subject of slavery, viewed in its social, moral, economic aspects. It was regarded as solely and exclusively a matter of state jurisdiction, and therefore one which did not concern the federal government or the states where it did not exist. Uneasy compromise was always reached in Congress, but the animosity between the free and slave states continued to grow, especially when the number of free states were suddenly in the majority. And when religious reform began spreading in the North, crying for the absolute abolition of slavery, the South found itself on the defensive. For years, Missourians and Iowans had petitioned to open and settle the fertile territory to their west, but failed. Then in 1853, Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas proposed a bill to open up the Nebraska Territory for a transcontinental railroad. To maintain that dangerous, delicate balance between the two sections, he suggested dividing the territory into two, calling the bill Kansas, Nebraska, inciting a firestorm in Congress. It essentially killed the Missouri Compromise and abolished the Mason-Dixon line by which the limits of slavery were restricted. It substituted the principle of popular sovereignty, which supposedly allowed the people who settled the state to decide whether slavery would abide there or not. But abolitionists and their allies moved heaven and earth to accomplish its defeat. Of course we tried to defeat that cursed bill. It was an outrage to consider annulling the sacred compact of the Missouri Compromise and allowing the spread of slavery once again. Using the radical theory of popular sovereignty, the presumption was that settlers in the northern portion of the territory, Nebraska, would oppose slavery, while those in the southern half, Kansas, would permit it. Naturally, to the Missouri way of thinking, Kansas would be settled by Missourians just as our ancestors had come from Kentucky and other slaveholding states. And naturally, our, our slaves would go with us. As Congress passionately debated Kansas, Nebraska, abolitionists like Eli Thayer began to enlist immigrants to settle Kansas and keep it free from slavery. These immigration companies were also meant to make a profit for Eastern investors. The plan was no less than to found free cities and extemporize free states. The contest took the form of the people against tyranny and slavery. The whole crowd of slave drivers and traitors, backed by a party organization, a corrupt majority in Congress, administration with its officers armed with revolvers, all together proving totally insufficient to cope with an aroused people. Congress narrowly passed the Kansas-Nebraska bill, and President Franklin Pierce signed it into law on May 30th, 1854. With that stroke of a pen, thousands packed their wagons and headed west. With the nation watching, the battle over slavery would soon be fought in the new territory of Kansas.